What's up everybody, it's Ryan Pettigrew with Zenith Home Loans and I have Brian Cowdery here with Atlas Real Estate and we are here to talk to you about all the fun investing and market update things for April yeah, 2023. Exactly, yep. Um, all right, so you're an investment specialist first yes, and foremost, right. correct? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously you help all kinds of people. Yeah, but, for sure. But um, you've, had, you've had a lot of success with investing yourself right. and now you are guiding a lot of families and clients into financial wealth through real estate. Exactly. Um, now, when you when we look at investment properties as a whole, how are the what are the ways from a because you do a lot of long term investing? What are the yeah, really like the five sure. ways that investment properties make money for clients? Totally, it's a great yeah. question. Yeah. So there's, you know, everybody really thinks about one way to make money, yeah. and that's on the the cash flow, right? Okay. Every single month wanting to know how much money am I going to get when I buy an investment property. Yeah. Um, there's actually five ways. Okay. And, and that's one way for sure. It's cash flow. Cash flow. Okay. Yep. And that's, you actually need it to cash flow. Now, it's how much are you comfortable with it cash flowing? Do you need a lot because you're actually looking for monthly income? Or are you looking yeah. for, hey, I don't care about cash flow as much. I'm okay with less of that if I can get some other benefits. Sure. Right? Sure. And so, so one is cash flow. Um, that's obvious. It's everything that you get after... Um, your rent comes in and all your expenses are taken away, okay. whatever's left over. Net That's income. That's your monthly cash flow. Yep. Net, net income. Perfect. Exactly. Okay. Right. Uh, the second way you can make money in investing mm -hmm. is um, on your mortgage pay down, right? So your principal balance on your loan yep. comes down over time and your uh, renter or your tenant, however you want to call, you know, call them, they're paying that down, right? Uh -huh. So um, that money's going to you in the long term as that principal balance goes down. Right. Um, that's going to come back to you eventually. Okay. Right. So that's the second way. Okay. Uh, the third way is appreciation of the property itself. Mm. So that's been pretty sweet over the last couple. It's of been years, awesome. Right. It's been <laughs> out of control. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. Abnormal. Yeah. I mean, don't you wish you would have had like ten properties or more? You know. Yeah. The last Hindsight twenty twenty for sure. Hundred percent. No doubt yeah. about that. Yeah. When's the best time to buy an investment property? Right now, yeah. or like 20 years ago, right? Right, <laughs> right. yeah, exactly. <laughs> in 2008, when everything crashed. Yes, um, that's very true. So appreciation, but normally most properties are going to appreciate anywhere from 3 to 5% every year, right? Mm -hmm. So not only is your principal balance going down, your appreciation is going up, and so that's going to give you more equity mm -hmm. um, over time, right? Mm -hmm. So there's three ways right there. Yep. Your fourth, so we've, got, we've got cash flow. We've got cash flow. You got uh, principal buy down yep. or pay down, yep. and then you got equity appreciation, uh, I'm sorry, appreciation, yep, yep, yep. Uh, year over year, mm -hmm. right? So those things are all happening um, throughout the year. Yes. The next thing is when it comes to tax time, right? So there's mm, quick people, disclaimer. A lot, don't, a lot of people don't think about this. A lot of people tax don't benefits, which is huge. It's massive. Exactly. It's massive. More it's than actually, any, a lot of more than anything, really, right? Yes. Like when you're writing off. All the depreciation, your expenses, depreciation, expenses. just having a mortgage That's too, right. right? All of that. That's so, right. Yeah, I guess talk more about what that looks like. It, exactly. It's it's actually something that there's a lot of things you can do there. And of course, I'm not a tax professional. <laughs> Brian's not a tax professional. Yeah, underneath here. Yeah, yeah contact your CPA. Contact right? there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we'll speak in general terms about yep. it. But you mentioned depreciation. So yep. um, real estate is, uh, if, if you go, most businesses, if you go buy something, you can depreciate your assets over time, right? Yep. Well, real estate's the one asset you can buy that you can depreciate, but it's also going to appreciate just like we talked about, right? Mm -hmm. So if I go buy a computer, that computer is not going to go up in value over time, right? Yep. But uh, tax time, if I go buy that computer, I'm going to depreciate it. Right. If I go buy a house, I can depreciate it, get that tax benefit, and it's going to appreciate. Yeah. It's one of the so only good. things in the world that's so going to do that for you. So, so that's huge. You also get all your expenses, right? So maintenance, um, your property management fees, anything that's an expense, insurance, uh, all those things are going to play into that as well. And so you get to, you know, mileage. If you go visit your rental property, you get to buy, you know, you get a, that's a tax write off. Yeah. If your rental property is in a different state and you take a trip out there to go do something for it. Expense um, plane ticket. an expense. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep, yep. Right. So you have all those expenses you can write off. Um, there's also, uh, an, uh, a thing a lot of people don't know about, and it's called accelerated depreciation. In the first year, you buy it, hmm. um, and there's there's uh, certain things around it. You know, you have to make sure that you talk to a tax accountant. Yeah. You know, who knows yeah. what they're talking about. Um, but in the first year, if you buy an investment property, you can accelerate a lot of that depreciation, 
and take a, a bigger benefit out of that and maybe get some income back mm. at tax time. So then you can use that to go buy another investment property. Your wizard, Harry. So, <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> so, um, so that's four ways. We said there's five, right? Yep. So the fifth way is it's a hedge against inflation. Okay. Okay. What do you mean by hedge against inflation? Great. Yeah. Talk to me. That's a nerdy term, right? Like, <laughs> right. what does that even mean? Because we're seeing inflation right now. That's so. right. Think about it. This is the best way to think about it, right? If I have my mortgage payment, I know this is not what most mortgage payments are right now. Let's say it's a thousand dollars mortgage payment sure. every month. Just for okay? the sake of simplicity here. For simplicity. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So I have a thousand dollars a month. For 30 years, I'm paying $1,000 a month on that. Now, of course, we know taxes will go up, some of that sure. kind of stuff. But sure. the actual payment on the loan yep. stays the same for that 30 years, right. right? So the value of the dollar, as the dollar gets weaker with inflation, right. I don't now have to pay more on that house for mm -hmm. my mortgage payment. Right. So I'm actually getting more value out of my dollar right? and paying the same amount, even though if I were to buy it 10 years from now, it costs me a lot more. Right. And that ties into your cash flow analysis. That's right. Right. Because a lot of investors are maybe even comfortable with a little bit of an even or even negative cash flow for year one. For sure. Right. Yep. Rates are There's high. There's a stabilization period that can happen there. Exactly. Yep. Right. Depends on what market you're in right now. But Denver right. market, we're in a pretty hot market. You know, we're not getting houses for very cheap and nope. so unless you've got a big down payment right you may be in that 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 category that's but right if you look at this like a long-term investment as you most likely will you can see what the general trend is going to be i mean that's shoot right. last year this time last year rent was increasing 18 percent year over year that's right you know we're probably going to see closer to like home price appreciation three to five percent uh-huh you know but exactly. if you can you know expect that over time too yeah. You're only going to see your wealth grow 100 percent in 10 or 20 yeah. years. Yeah. Right? We're talking about yeah. long-term holds here. We're not talking yeah. about in a year or anything yeah. like that. Yep. This is over time. We're looking at the big picture of what investment properties do for you. And these things compound. Like you said, rents will increase yep. over time. Property, you know, um, values increase, that principal balance gets paid down. Um, and here's the other thing that I think a lot of people don't think about. Um, they think about, well, I'm gonna have to pay for all those expenses out of pocket, right? Well, if you do it right and you're cash flowing and you have a good reserve balance, it's right. a part of that, mm -hmm. you're not paying for anything. And, and that's the thing. You need to really have like someone who can analyze these properties well with you so that, you know, if, if I have a $5,000 reserve account and my water heater goes out and I have to pay $2,000, yeah. it comes out of that reserve account. And then the rent, that cash flow builds that reserve account back up, right? Yep. It's, it's something to think about, like, you're not really paying for all of that. Yes, you are, you know, sure. um, because you get the income from the rent. Yeah. But the thing is, ultimately, your your tenants and the rent that's coming in is what's paying for all of that. Right, right. It, I mean, it's it's treating it like a business, right? 100%. Making sure you're covering the whatever the 10%, we'll call it in expenses. That's right. And um, yep. you showed me a pretty awesome sheet a couple weeks ago. Incredible spreadsheet. Incredible spreadsheet that yeah. Brian has that I can tell you right now is very very unique to him specifically even investment specific agents yes. i don't think have access to this kind of stuff so right. really cool exactly um yep. so now we've we've talked about um we've talked about the the ways that you can grow wealth with real estate right um there's ways to finance it too that's right right yeah and that's where a little where i come into things um exactly. so as a residential loan officer yeah. I can do financing up to four units. Right. Right. And um, you're in the process, before we dive into what I can do, you're in the process of buying a bigger multifamily Correct. Uh, property. That's so right. what what kind of financing are you getting on a property like that? Great question. So yeah, yeah so I just sold a single family residence that we have. Yep. Um, and we're gonna convert that doing a 1031 exchange, which is if you don't know what that is, it's just a way to avoid capital gains, paying capital gains tax. Yep. So all the profit that we're making and all of, um, from that sale, we're going to roll directly into another property. Right, exactly. And, so, and it goes into an intermediary company. That's right. That holds those funds for the interim. Right? Yeah. There's a certain amount of time you have to go buy yeah, and sell. Yeah, yeah, 90 right? days to identify yep. your next property, right. so on and so forth. Right, yeah. Right, exactly. So some rules around that. Yep. Um, and so... So we're taking that all that money as, as long as you don't touch it, then you don't have to pay capital gains on it. Yeah, that's the key. We're delaying. Right? We're delaying the taxes until we don't give. That's we don't right. care as much about them later on in life. Exactly. Right? Hundred exactly. percent. That's one thing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. That's a whole other subject we can yeah. go into talking about all that. Um, but yeah. So for that sake, so we're taking that. We're actually going to buy a twelve unit apartment mm -hmm. complex, right? Yep. So like Ryan said. Anything four and below is usually a residential type loan. Sure. Uh, and then when you go above four units, you're going into the commercial loan space. Yeah. Yep. 
Yeah, and so commercial loan space, uh, minimum down payment. Do you have an idea what that looks like? 20 to 25% okay. is minimum. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not bad though. Very similar to what an investment right. property is with me. That's right. Um, so really not, not a whole lot different there. There's there's a handful of different loan products that I have access to. You've mm -hmm. got your your traditional conventional mortgage. Right. You can put as little as 15% down. You're probably going to want to do 20 just based upon how, the difference in financing there. Right. Um, the best part is, is when you buy an investment property, you can use, if you have traditional income and assets, mm -hmm. you can use the potential rent on that property to help you qualify for it. That's right. So if you already own a primary property and you may not, you may not think you can qualify for two mortgages, this is a great way for you to get into mm -hmm. an investment property uh, because you don't have to qualify solely for two mortgages, Right. which is amazing. It's awesome. Um, the other program we have is for somebody who doesn't have traditional income. It's called a DSCR loan. This is a great option. A lot it's of people don't know about this It's an amazing option. Either. And a lot of people right. don't know about it. And the rates are very similar. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, like I said, for people who don't have traditional income, you're self-employed or maybe just investors, right, right that, that don't have that right off a lot of expenses, don't have net income on their tax returns. That's and right. it's DSCR stands for debt service, debt service coverage ratio. Yep. It's a complicated way of saying as long as the potential rent on a property covers the mortgage payment and or more then the deal qualifies which is which seems way too simple way but too that simple really is what it comes down to right 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 and it's great it's a it's a great way to stack properties as long as you have the money down yeah so typically about 20 percent down is what and, you need and it's actually really similar to yep. commercial loans yep. as well as um as i've been getting this one yeah you know they they want to make sure the property another word, way to say that the property takes care of itself mm -hmm. right and as long as the property your income you have enough margin to cover all you know the rent coming in yeah with vacancy taking vacancy into account all that kind of stuff as long as the property is going to pay for the mortgage that's what matters more than anything absolutely yep and then we've got a, a third program maybe you're buying an investment property and we're looking at this from a long-term standpoint we're like ah uh, we don't know if the the rent's going to cover the mortgage payment right, right out of the gate right right maybe it's a year or two before that happens and you don't have traditional income mm -hmm. so now we're getting a little bit finer into what we can get into from a a, a loan qualification standpoint right we can use what's called a bank statement loan so we're just going to look at your deposits and your withdrawals on either personal or business bank statements. Yep. And that's a great way for self-employed borrowers specifically yes. that right. that do write off a lot of expenses because, you know, who wants to pay taxes on the business? Right. I get it. Yep. Um, that's a great way to get into an investment property too. So a lot of for different sure. options. Obviously, every situation is a little bit different too. I actually want to point out another thing and yeah. I'd like to have you speak on to it yeah. too. Um, one thing you can do is a, is a house hacking is what it's been calling now, yeah. right? So you can go buy a duplex and live in it, right? right? That's, or, yep. or triplex or quadplex mm -hmm. and still get a residential loan. Yeah. But how does that differ from if you're going to buy just an investment property that you're not going to live in? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And it's a great way for young people especially mm -hmm. um, to get into properties. I mean, if you're okay um, you know, in your later years to go and move a little bit yeah. and, and stack properties that way, still a great option. But basically the, what Brian's talking about is couple things you can do is you can go buy, let's say a duplex and live in one side, rent out the other. Mm -hmm. You can still get a primary uh, mortgage, which is a lot better than an investment loan because you only need 5% down, Right. Um, which is great. That's huge. Um, and, and so when you go that route, then now you live in it, now you've got a primary home and say you live in it for a year, you can now rent the other property out or the right. other side out and go do that again and, and again. does your financing change? Nope. That's right. Exactly. And so yeah. what I've had a couple clients do as well is maybe not even do the duplex route. Maybe they just go buy a single family, live in it for a year, go buy another single family. I've got a client on his third property. He's under 30 right now. Mm -hmm. And so he'll have three properties by the time he's 30 by just putting 5% down on each property. Yep. Pretty and your cool. rate... And what's the difference between your rate on a on doing that as opposed to an investment property? Who it's a lot. It's a big difference. Yeah, half a percent at least. Right. At least, maybe more. Um, yeah. So that's the, and really the point. Yeah. yeah. And what I love about that yeah. is you're never going to get better financing than doing it that way. Right. right. Exactly. On an investment property. That's what we did. So we our yeah. last house we rented out. I'm sorry. We we lived in it. Yeah. For a while, it was our own primary residence. Yeah. Uh, for I think about three years. And then I looked at it and I was like, we can rent this out. And then we moved and we had that same great financing. We didn't have to change it at all. Talk about cash flow pretty quickly, right? Cash flow, yeah. it's, it's one of the best ways to get into investing and then to get good financing and get good cash flow. Yeah, exactly. Yep.
Exactly. So especially as you live in it over a few years, you know, if we talk about appreciation, rents going up, all those things factor into it. Yeah. Um, it's one of the, the best ways to, to get, get into that space. Yep. Um, all right. So we've talked about, you know, how you can make money. Yep. Loan options. Now, um, Mr. Realtor, I, I've got questions. <laughs> what, what, do yes. I, what should I be asking? You know, I think a lot of people right. don't know the questions to be asking about investing in real estate. I think that's probably something that you do really well as you that's open right. up that door about just creating, hey, here's the education for it. But I'm somebody on the street. I'm looking to go and invest in real estate. Right. What are the questions I should be asking my realtor? Great, great question. Yeah. So um, I want to back up a little bit from that because okay. one of the things um, that – when you're looking into getting investing, what, what happens is we get excited about it, right? We watch a bunch of YouTube videos or we listen to a bunch of podcasts and we go, this sounds amazing. I'm hearing all these stories about how all these people are making money and investing, yeah. but what do I do? Yeah. You know, how do I start? And, and so you start saying, oh, well, let me just talk to some agents you know, that I know. Let me talk to some lenders that I know. Let me talk to friends who I know have investment properties. Right. Um, but, but you catch the vision of investing, but then you just don't know what to do with it. Right, right? the practicality of exactly. it. Exactly, right? yep. yeah. yeah. So what's really important is you're talking to agents and you are trying to figure out, okay, how does all this apply to my specific situation? You need to ask them several questions. I think one that's really important is what kind of investment properties does that agent um, and own themselves, right? What's their experience? Right. Have For they sure. bought a duplex? Have they lived in something and then rented it out and moved somewhere else? Have yeah. they bought a commercial you know, up above four units? property. Yeah. All those things matter because it's somebody who's lived through it, right? It's the old, old saying, like, if I'm going to hire a personal trainer, I'm going to hire someone who's really <laughs> fit, who's really, you know, looks good. They've been through it. They know what it takes to get there. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that you want to have, you know, all agents, you're licensed and you can, once you're licensed in um, Colorado, yeah, I can help anybody buy, you know, my license allows me to help anyone buy anything yeah. real estate wise, yeah. right? Land, multi-property, Land, single commercial, family. Yeah, yeah the whole we thing. get into all kinds of things yep. like that, right? But just because I can doesn't mean I know how to. Correct. And I think that's the big thing. Yep. So having someone who's forged the path themselves, yes. who knows how to, um, how the ins and outs, um, because they've lived it, I think that's a big it's question a, you need to ask. It's a massive differentiator. Yeah. And people who tell you it isn't, it's I, I I couldn't disagree more. That's right. Yeah, you, you need somebody who's well well versed in it because there are a lot of nuances right that happen amongst right. the numbers and you know that's a lot of it too is running the numbers the making numbers sure you run it the right way. Piece of it, yeah, right, absolutely. Exactly. Yep. Um, so I think that's one of the big questions you yep. got to ask. I mean, yep. same on the lending side, right? You don't want to, you know, you don't want a lender saying, yeah, I can I can help you, you know, in this investment loan, and they've never done it themselves. Right. I think. It's just, it just gives you that experience and that, all that knowledge around it that you wouldn't have otherwise. Yep, exactly. So okay. uh, next, I would say for sure, um, you know, how can you help me find and then analyze a property? Yeah. Right? So you know, the, the big thing is I think a lot of people, you'll look at it and say, okay, as long as my rent covers my mortgage, then it's a good, a good investment, right? Yeah. Um, but there's a lot more that goes into it. You know? So um, first of all, you have, there's a lot of numbers you need to consider. Yeah. And there's a lot of things you need to look at. So and what are like the top three that you would say that outside of Good cash question. flow, right? Yeah. That I should be really looking at as an investor. You want to look at cash flow, but you also want to look at what are all your expenses. Mm. And your expenses are not just mortgage, insurance, taxes. Yeah. Um, like what about property management? What about other monthly maintenance? You know, yeah. those are those are obvious things. There's a lot of non-obvious things, right? So vacancy rate. Are you considering that into the equation? Exactly. Um, are you That's considering what's called bad debt? Yeah. Most people don't know what bad debt is. It basically is if, if I have a, a renter uh, or a tenant who they leave um, and their, their lease ends and then they don't pay me that last $1,000 of rent, I'm probably never going to see that again. So I need to factor that into my equation as well. Right, right? exactly. Because that's yeah. the difference between an investor who stays successful that's right. and an investor who thought this was all sunshine and rainbows and is like, I'm out. Exactly, right? 100%. You're if, getting a bad deal. Right. If, yep. you pre- if you prepare for it and it's and it doesn't happen, great. That's right. But if it happens and you're prepared, it's part of the plan. It's part of the plan. Exactly. It's already built into yeah. the model, into yep. what you're looking for. Yep. So that's another big one. Okay. What about expense growth, right? The cost of repairing my dishwasher... 10 years ago is not the cost of today. Right. So we have to account for over time, how's that expense going to grow? 100%. How is taxes going to grow, yep. right? Tax, your, your payment's going to go up over time, so we need to account for that mm-hmm. as well and make sure just because it works today, we need to make sure it works tomorrow too, mm. right? So we're not just looking at, is this deal going to work for me right now yeah. for the next year? You know, If your plan is to hold it for 10 years, you need to make sure this works 
every year yeah. for the next 10 years. Right. 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 Exactly. And that's, and that's what I love about what you do is, yeah. you, is you forecast the future really well. And it, it's not about necessarily the here and now. That's right. It's right? not just about the here and now. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's great. So, so those are big things yeah. as, as you're analyzing and looking and making sure like these, all these numbers are going to work. Obviously you could say, how much of a down payment do I need? What's the interest rate? Yeah. I've got to factor that piece in because what's my, now my debt payment on this property and Maybe the numbers work um, at 25%, but maybe I need to have, you know, 40% down to get the numbers to work and then we're sure, good. Sure. But you need to be able to like move all those, you know, pieces, yeah. dial Twist all the knobs, the knobs a little bit. Exactly. Right, 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 exactly. Then it's like, okay, well, if we didn't put that 15% down and we keep it at 25 right. and we put it over here, where does it fall into that bucket? Right. 100%. Um, so it's a lot of, it's a lot yeah. of, yeah, give and take. Give and so, take yeah. there. Yeah. The other thing is how am I going to increase the rents? How am I going to add value to the property? Mm. Yep. To, that ways to look at that creatively, right. right? Is there a space in the building if you're buying, like I have a fourplex down in Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. um, there's a space in there for laundry, so a laundry service. So I have a company that puts in the machines, they charge, you know, they handle all the payments and everything. Nice. And then I get a piece of that um, every month. There you, you go. Know, laundry income. Nice. That was a way to add value to the property. Perfect, right? right. Maybe I'm buying, you know, uh, I need to look at the conditions of property, right? How much can I put into this and then increase rents later as well? Right. So what we, what I do and we look at is saying, you know, maybe we're going to put 5000 into each unit and we know mm -hmm. we're going to increase rents by $300. Yeah. Something else you got to think about there and, and play that into the whole model and the whole equation. There you go. A third way to do this is what's called RUBS. It's called Ratio Utility Billing System. It's a fancy way to say... I'm going to charge my tenants uh, rent, so $1,000 a month. Yep. But if I'm paying for all the utilities, I'm going to charge each each uh, unit another $100 for the utility payment. Mm. So a lot of uh, properties, um, they just charge flat rent and don't think about the utility side of it. Mm. So you can increase uh, your income on that investment property by doing that as well. So, you, Smart. so you're not only looking at what's how is it currently performing, you're yep. also looking at what's it going to perform if I do these things, X, Y, Z. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. This is awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun. Is there anything else I should be asking on? Yes. Okay. I would say, where can you help me? How are you going to help yeah. me find a property and mm. where? Can there you, you go. There's, that's property? the most important part. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> where are you going to find the deal for me? That's right. Are you, am I going to have to find, am I going to have to run the numbers? That's right. Or, you know, talk about it. And is it in Colorado? Is it in other states? Talk about that. Because exactly. you guys got... You've got a really strong base and a, a few different awesome investment That's um, right. cities. So I'd love to hear about 100%. that. 100%. When you're looking for investment properties, you're looking at it, like you said, it's yeah. a perfect way to say it. It's a business, right? You're looking at how do I make sure everything's going to run the way it's supposed to and perform yeah. the way it needs to. Yep. So um, so Colorado was a great place to invest 10 years ago, 15 yeah. years ago. Tough you know nowadays, I mean? for it's sure. It's really hard to find a good investment property in Colorado yeah. if you, unless you have a really big down payment. Right. It's hard to get the numbers to work. Right. So what do you do? You need to go to markets and other places um, that that have or still have that good potential for rents, and you can um, still get properties at uh, lower um, value yeah. than what you can get here. Right. So what you need to ask your agent um, or anybody you're working with is, what kind of access do you have to other markets to help me find investment right. and properties? That's, and a lot of people think like, oh, I need to buy where I live. So what would you tell the, the person that's a little bit hesitant on buying an investment property that's not yeah. in the place they live? Because totally. like, if you don't, if it's not in front of you, it's a little bit daunting. That's right. Right? So how it's do you work through daunting. that? I mean, to yeah. me, I'm almost, I almost kind of like that it's not in town. Right. Because then I don't have the access to go there. <laughs> exactly. You know, I really see it from a number standpoint more right. than anything. You don't get emotionally attached. That's right. But to the people who do feel that, what does that look like? And how do you get across that bridge? It's a great question because I've been there. Yeah. You know, I always thought I want to be close to my property so I can keep an eye on them and I want to be close to them. Yeah. As I've gotten older and busier and you know yeah. more kids and all that stuff right. that comes with that, right. um, I, I, I want to spend as little time as I can on my properties and I just yeah. want to make sure they're, they're performing. Right. So, um, so that actually prevented me from buying for a while. I thought I got to just find places in Colorado. Yeah. I thought it was really hard to buy out of state or other markets. And the truth is um, there's, there's two, two things around that. One... Mm -hmm. Because Denver is so hard and Colorado is getting harder to invest yeah. in, yeah. Um, you do ha you have to go other places. You don't have a choice, yeah. if you, especially if you're trying to get into it for the first time, right? Yep. And so you, you have to think about it differently. This, these are not places we're trying to live in. These are not places we are 
uh, we want to make sure it's a place that someone else will want to rent yes. and find places where that's still possible and gets the numbers to work. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. So, um, and then, you know, people are like, well, am I going to have to travel out there every time there's a toilet that's broken or things like that? If you have a good property manager and you build that into your model, like we talked about before, right? And that's an expense that you're already taking care of. They're going to take care of all that for yeah. you, right? So my, my goal with anybody I work with is you never have to step foot, except for when you go and inspect it before you buy it. Sure. You never have to step foot in it. Yeah. I've never been into my fourplex down in Colorado Springs. Even when I bought it, I haven't been in there. And has that been successful for you? It's been great. Great. You've got a management company that helps with that, right? Exactly. They do all of that for me. Mm -hmm. Um, And the beauty of it, especially in this day and age, right? We can do video walkthroughs. We can do pictures. Yeah. You know, so, and I get a monthly, or not monthly, I'm sorry, yearly inspection report. Well, they'll say, here's everything that's going on. Here's some things maybe we could fix. All of that. So... It's not no work at all. You know what I mean? That's a bad way to say right. that. It's not like you're not going to do any work, but um, but it's it's less work. And the goal of an investment property is that it works for you. Right. But you're not constantly spending time and working for it. Right. You don't. It's like it's like working virtually or in the office. That's right. You know, you can work virtually these days, and That's that, right. that goes for real estate too. Hundred percent. And I yeah. love that because it's it, you make it seem so much more simple than it than a lot of people feel like yes. it, it, it is. Right. Right. And that's why I love, love what you guys have over at Atlas. Totally. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the things that, and those are big barriers. And, and once you kind of explain through and say, here's how we mitigate yeah. those things. Here's how we make sure we take care of, you know, all those things. And we have margin around it. Yeah. Then it just gives you confidence to go, okay, like it's all taken care of. This is why we do these things. This yeah. is why we have these things in place so that you can go for it and you go right. find something. And when it works and the numbers work and everything's set up you know it's a good decision going into it. You're not going in with any doubts. Yeah, you are well prepared going into it. Yeah, totally. So, Brian, you've got these things with Atlas Real Estate, Mm -hmm. and um, we've talked a lot about this, just about how you create an impact in people's lives. And you've come up with, I think that, I think there's a lot of people, there's a lot of companies out there that have these sayings that they say what they don't live by. You live by this stuff, Mm -hmm. right? So... You, you, the first one you have here is, is real estate with a purpose, right? right? You're buying intentionally, yep. you're selling meaningfully, uh-huh. and you're investing powerfully. Yes. That's a, those are pretty like heavy words for they people. They are heavy. So that's right. like, what is, what does all of that mean yes. in like, in real life, um, everyday living for you as a real estate agent? Yeah, Absolutely. You know, one of the biggest things for me going into this business and as I think about with every client is why are we doing what we're doing, yeah. right? There's a lot of things that play into that, but ultimately it comes down to what, where is it that our clients want to go? What is it they need? Where are they trying to go? You know, yeah. what, what for their specific situation and their place in life where they're at, job situation, family situation, all those things, yeah. what, what's the best way to help them get to where they need to go next, mm-hmm. right? And so when it comes to being about purpose, it really is, we're not just in it to just, okay, let's just sell your house and and let's just go buy another one. Right, right. Buy, sell, buy, sell. Are you a buyer? Are you a seller? Like, like it's much bigger than that, right? Like, these are big life decisions, first of all. And people matter. They're really, really important. And this is is not something to be taken lightly with. Mm. You know, so as I think about doing things purposefully in real estate, you know, buying intentionally, right? So do we just go buy a house and then hope it works out, you know? And then later, I mean, we, we did this with our very first house. We bought something. I was like, man, I wish we would have thought about this, 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 right? You know, and like if we would have just thought through this a little bit more, you know, then we could have, we would have bought something different. Yeah. How many times have you heard that from clients, right? I'll, I'll, unfortunately, more than I'd like to, yeah. to, to admit for sure. 100%. Yeah. So we think about buying intentionally. Do you want to get into investing eventually, yeah. right? Well, then we need to think about, can we do a duplex? Can we buy a smaller house that's maybe a little bit distressed, put some work into it, live in it for a year or so, and then move on to something else? Do you need a home that you can raise some kids in next, right? And what does that need to look like? Do you work from home? Do we need to have an office in there? Do you entertain a lot? Do you not want to entertain? You know, we bought our house without a dining room because we don't want to do Thanksgiving at our house. (laughs) So, great. Sorry, we don't have the room. Perfect. I don't know what so to do. Yeah. I'm definitely going to buy a house that doesn't have a dining room next. <laughs> exactly. Pro I don't tip like cleaning right there. All the dishes That's right. 
<laughs> just can't do it. Sorry, I want to, but I can't. Um, oh, that's great. And so, so like, let's be intentional about yeah. what we're buying. Let's think beyond just the next year. Let's think, you know, in two years, what is our plan? Three years, whatever. And so that we really find the house um, or the duplex or whatever you want to do yeah. to make sure it really meets that goal. Yeah. And we're not just being, you know, just going into it without really thinking through that. 100%. So what's your purpose? We're going to buy something intentionally. Yeah. Selling it meaningfully. I tell a lot of people you shouldn't sell. And, and before we dive into that sure. too, that is a rarity amongst real estate agents. There's a lot of people that from a real estate agent standpoint will guide you towards selling right. quicker than you need to, because guess what? That means a paycheck for it means them. A paycheck for them, right? Exactly. Right, and so I right. think it's it's really powerful that you take such a such an advisory approach to this, yeah. On how you're creating basically like a life plan through real estate, right? I, that's kind of what I think about. That's what really you're doing. what it comes down to, right? Right, because I think like, a lot of all people the steps along the way we need to take. Hundred percent. Most mm-hmm. people are like deposit in my four hundred one k. I'll have a great retirement when I'm sixty five or seventy. And yes. and you're saying there's a different way to do things, right? Right, and exactly. so that's what I love about it. So, anyways, keep hundred percent. No. Oh, and that's actually a really good point. So, yeah. like, do, does it make sense to sell? Sometimes it does, yeah. right? Sometimes you need to sell so you can have a down payment for your next house, right? Yeah. But maybe we can do like the heel, you know, do a HELOC, and yeah. we'll talk about that here yeah, in a minute yeah, yeah, too. Yeah. Um, can I put a HELOC on this and rent it out and then go buy something else? Yeah. You know, we don't. We want to sell it. You know, when I say sell meaningfully too, we're not just going to throw a sign in the yard and throw it in the MLS and hope for the best. Let's be intentional, going back to that, about how we're going to sell your house. Let's make sure we create a buyer experience, you know, mm-hmm. that they they create that create the desire in buyers' minds that they can see themselves living there. Yeah. You know, that's that all goes into it, right? So if you are going to sell, but maybe you don't you shouldn't sell, right? And I think that's the thing. We don't want to just sell just because we think that's what we should do. Right. Let's think through all the options. And right. if that is the option, then we'll do it in a way that maximizes how much money you can get out of it. 100%. Because I think a lot of people are like, you know what? I made a bunch of money. I'm going to take that money and put it into a new house. Right. But from a numbers standpoint, that may not make sense. May not make sense. Right? Exactly. It may not make the most sense. For sure. That might be option two or three. Right. But option one is, is how do we get renters or short-term rental going that That's right. pays for your mortgage while it appreciates in time? and. A hundred percent. There's a lot of that we dive into. Right? All kinds right. of details that come yeah. into that. Right. Yeah. But again, it goes to what's the purpose? Why are we doing this? And yeah. does it make sense? Yeah. Right. Um, and then lastly, you know, invest powerfully. You know, it's everything I just talked about, yeah. about when you're looking for an investment property, let's make sure it works and make sure it actually is going to do what you want it to do. You know, like right. is cash flow important? Then we need to make sure we find a property that's going to have good cash flow yeah. so that you can have that monthly income. Maybe you don't need that. Maybe you want to hang on to something for 10 years. Mm-hmm. As long as it covers itself, but you want it to appreciate more, yeah. then we, we, need to, we need to invest in that, in that way, right? right? Right. So it's, it's really thinking about, you know, let's do it. Let's not get into bad deals, right? That's really what it comes down to. For sure, 100%. You know, you're not investing powerfully if you buy something that doesn't work. You right. know? Then you're going backwards. And the, the whole point is to go forward towards your goals and what you want to do, right. you know, instead of um, just guessing and wondering, like, let's be confident in our decisions. Let's move forward yeah. and know that this is the best option for us. Absolutely. And I think uh, on top of that, too, I, I like to keep using you as an example because you've mm-hmm. done this multiple times right. and you have multiple properties. A- another way that you've invested powerfully is you've taken an asset that you've held for a while. Right. Uh, was it? Did you sell single family or multi-unit property to do the one that you're doing in? in doing Missouri? right now. Yeah. Yeah. So that one is a single family. Yeah. So you, so you took a single family that you rented out, and now you're getting into a, a multi multi-unit property. Right. You were basically an apartment owner. Did you exactly. ever think to yourself ten years ago you would own an apartment? Never. Right. Absolutely exactly. Not. Ever. Like that is investing powerfully. Right. Right. All exactly. because of one single family home. Hundred percent. And I think it's a that access is a lot. There's a you have a lot more accessibility to this, people right. do, with people like you in their life. Yeah. Creating that that exposure to it. That's right. Right. And here's what it all really comes down to. All those things yeah. is about creating options for people. Sure. Right. So if 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 you if you think about real estate, yes, we're trying to make money. Yes, yeah. we're trying to make sure it all cash flows and all those things happen, right? Yeah. But what does it really do for you in the end? It gives you options. So I like to use the analogy of a 429 or 529 yeah, account for, yep, yeah, yeah. for college investing, yep. right? So you can dump, you know, let's say you, you put in $50,000 into this account, right? And it grows maybe, what's, what do you think the yield would be on that? Maybe 6 Yeah, 7%? we'll call it 7%. Yeah, sure. it's kind of sure. yield, return yeah. on investment. Yeah. Okay. 
So you put that in there, you take, um, and then what happens? You, you put all that in there, it grows over time, your child grows up, they want to go to college, and then you can use it. Sure. But what happens if they don't want to go to college? Yeah. Uh, well, I've got to take it out with a bunch, bunch of penalties. That's right. Yeah. Now you got to take it out, or maybe you hope your next kid's going to go to college, <laughs> right. and you can roll it over to that, right. to that kid. Or what if you only have a, one child? Right. right. Or what if you have a child who doesn't need to go to college because they're a genius and they can go do something else or they can go into sports or yeah. they can go all these other options, right? Yeah. Not everybody goes to college. And yes, it's great to have that there. But what if instead you can buy buy an investment property, you know, buy them a single family home mm-hmm. um, that's going to do all those things we just talked about, yeah. right? And I'm going to take that same $50,000 as a down payment. And now maybe like I know someone who does this, he put a 15 year note on that property. So when his kid is born, he buys a house, 15 years later, it's paid off. And then if your child goes to college, what are your options? Right. You can sell it. You can, you can get a HELOC. It. You can get a HELOC. Yeah. You can just use the monthly rent that's right. coming in. Right. Now you don't have a mortgage payment on it. Right. Right. And maybe that's covering the cost. You can sell it and get a bigger multi-unit property and still probably have money left over right. for them to go to college. So like there's yep. a double whammy there. And what if they don't go to college? I mean, you then just you keep still it. Get the monthly <laughs> yeah, income, right, right? Exactly. yeah, you still get the monthly income. Right. And now you can 1031 it. Yep. Uh, you you keep the money for yourselves. Or if they want to go to some other school that maybe isn't covered under 529. Yeah. I don't know 529 is that well, but what yeah. if I don't know if trade schools, for example, are covered or yeah. not? I mean, there's definitely some places that aren't for sure. Yeah. And so what does so that what look if they, like? What if that's who they are and that's who they, you know, that's what they need to do in their life and that's yeah. their purpose? Well, now you have that option that you can pay for it anything or maybe you want to help them with their down payment on their first house i mean there's so it's all about creating options and there you go what if you want to start your own business someday yeah you know and but you only have your job and only that income coming in yeah well if you have a rental property that's providing income every month now you don't have to make as much in that business and you have more freedom and options to do that yeah that's really what this really comes down to in the end is how do we create options for you and make moves now so that in 10, 15, 20 years, you'll be set up to have those options. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. So good. It's good. Very <laughs> powerful. Very it's powerful so stuff. Excited. Yes. <laughs> Tell you're passionate about it. That's for yeah. sure. Um, so this is all amazing stuff. And I think now that we dive in, we've dove into a lot of the investing side of things. Now that I get a lot of questions from people like, okay, so yes. we are in a very volatile economy. Right. Is investing in real estate even a good option right now? Yeah. You know, we, totally. we talk about the Silicon Valley bank collapse. Right. Um, you know, very briefly, for those that don't understand really what happened, it was essentially Silicon Valley Bank had a bunch of tech startups, capital uh, venture capitalists um, that were depositors in their account. Mm-hmm. Of course, as of late, I'm sure you're on LinkedIn, you're seeing a lot of people are getting laid off. These companies are going through tough times right, right. now. These are the first types of people that are types of companies that go through tough times. So what do they need to do? They need to dip into their savings for payroll. Mm-hmm. Um, they're laying off people, right? Well, as they're taking money out of their account, all the money that at Silicon Valley had had in their accounts was invested into treasuries and whatnot. And so these companies were taking money out and for Silicon Valley Bank mm-hmm. to get that money to them, they had to start selling all of these investments at a loss. And word got out, there was a frenzy. And so everybody basically took their money out out of fear. Gotcha. And so the and so the bank collapsed, right? And so people are like, okay, wow, that's that's pretty scary, right? It's, it's definitely very scary. very scary, but it's not going to happen again. The Fed is putting in some some measures to make sure that consumer confidence stays high because as mm-hmm. soon as consumer confidence goes out of the banking system, things can go bad. That's right. So now that we've got kind of a baseline idea about what happened, how does that tie into our mortgage and real estate world? Right. What's going to happen is people like to have cash on hand or a tangible asset Mm -hmm. that they can put a dollar amount on rather than having their money in the stock market or in banks right now, right? right? And so real estate, I think, is going to become, and I know it, I see it happening, investors, individuals, or bigger companies are just going to continue pumping money into real estate. Yep. That's what's going to happen over the span of time. So so every one out of six uh, transactions right now is an investor. So... Get in the game sooner. That's than a great that. stat to put yeah. in there, you know, and because I think a lot of times people, one, there's a lot of fear right now, yeah. right? And anytime there's fear, everybody yeah. gets paralyzed and says, "I'm not doing nothing." Anything. Yeah. I'm not doing nothing. It's terrible yeah. English. I ain't, doing <laughs> I ain't doing nothing. Yeah, I'm not doing nothing. You know, but those are the times when actually a lot of good things you can do a lot of good things, right? Yeah. If you can make 
make the numbers work, right? And yeah. so I think that's, it's all, you know, can you time the market? You can't. No. You can't, you can't do it. So what do you do? You do what you can with what you know, right? right. And if you, if you look at properties and you're, you're really building in the margin, you're using conservative estimates, and you're really looking at all those things we already talked about, yeah. right? Then if the numbers work, it's a good time to buy, right. you know, in downtimes and in uptimes. Yep. Absolutely. And so that's the thing. You look at this as a long-term investment, you're going to ride right. the wave. And I'll guarantee you right now, real estate's only going to continue appreciating because we are low on supply. That's right. We are low on supply yeah. and, and that's going to, to continue to put money in your, in your pocket as a real estate investor. Yeah. Um, another question I'm getting right now, now that we've do we dove into a lot of this is everybody has that owns a house probably has an interest rate that starts with a two or three. It's, they say okay. about 75 to 80% of mortgages out there have to start with a two or three. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we're seeing lack of inventory is because there are people that don't even want to think about buying because they don't want to give up that rate. Right. Um, or they're doing the smart thing and probably keeping that property uh, and renting it out or doing short-term rental, right? And so a lot of the people that have money tied up in a property yet they want to go buy a new one, we're mm -hmm. weighing the options for a HELOC. Right. And what a HELOC is, is it's called a home equity line of credit. It's basically the combination between a credit card and a mortgage. And the reason That's I say that- That's a great way that, to say it, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Try to make it as simple as possible. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's basically a line of credit, much yeah. like a credit card is, that you can draw as much as you want. So, like you can put just as much as, as you want on your credit card or as little as you want, but you've got a credit limit mm -hmm. based upon the certain value of your house and what your mortgages are. Usually you can't go up to more than 90% of your value with all of the mortgages on the property. Um, so we're looking at that with clients. Does that make yeah, sense? And does right. it tie into the numbers, right? If you were to keep this property and get a HELOC, let's say a $50,000 HELOC right now with the rare rates are maybe about four or $500 a month. Mm -hmm. Does that, does that additional monthly payment work into the numbers right. based upon what you can rate your property for? And so then I, start to talk to people like you who are really smart in this area. <laughs> and we talk about what does it right. look like to rent the property and how much do we think we can get it for? That's right. And then we look at, okay, so if we keep both properties, what does it look like over five or 10 years? What does your net worth look like? Mm -hmm. Right? And that's, that's right. what HELOCs allow us to do is just continue to, to, to grow that financial wealth. 100%. Through real estate. Yeah. I think that's, it's, so I'm going to ask you this too, because yeah. I always think it's good to know everything about what you're getting yourself into, yeah. right? So in the HELOC, yeah. uh, what are the terms? Like how does the interest rate work? Yeah. Does it go up or down? Does it stay the same? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's really two types of, of home equity mm -hmm. mortgages. There's a HELOC, home equity line of credit, that's a variable interest rate that's tied to the prime. So when you see in the, in the news about how the Fed, uh, the Fed funds rate is increasing, that's the rate. So things like um, HELOCs, credit cards, car loans, right? Those are all the rates that are tied to that. So, gotcha. As that goes up or down with the HELOC, so will that rate. So right now, Fed funds rates higher than it has been in a while, but they're probably going to cut it. Right. So your payment will actually probably go down. It'll go down. It'll go down over the next few years. So you're telling me if I can make the numbers work now, yes. at the rates where they're at now, right? It'll. That's probably we don't have crystal ball. Right. That's probably close to worst case scenario for now. Right. Absolutely. For yeah. the next five or ten years, I would think so. Mm -hmm. Um, the other type of loan that let people that are a little more uh, adverse to risk um, is a he loan. So you're still using equity out of the house, very similar to a HELOC. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about a heat with a HELOC is you have a, usually a 10 year draw period. I was going to ask you about that. I'm glad yeah. you're bringing it up. Yeah, 10 this is year good drop to know period. for people right. who think it's not like a 30 year loan, right? No, no. So it is a 30 year loan, but you're drawing yeah. for 10. It's an interest only payment, much like a credit card. Perfect. You can put yep. more if you want. And then after that period for 20 years, it'll be amortizing. Gotcha. So you're going to have principal and interest that you'll pay over that span of time. Right. And you can no longer draw after that 10 year period. Right. Exactly. Right. So you'd have to either get another HELOC or not. Yeah. Uh, a HE loan is very similar, but it has a fixed rate. Mm -hmm. You still have a draw period um, where it's interest only. And mm -hmm. then you've got a 20 year repayment amortizing uh, period. So you've got those options, which is nice. It's so, huge. So if you want to lock yourself into that payment, you know exactly what the payment's going to be over right. 10 years. You can plan a little bit better. Great. Yep. In my viewpoint, I think a HELOC is probably best right now because we're just in For a, sure. we're kind of, we increased the Fed funds rate from about 0% to, I think it was like basically 5% mm -hmm. over the last 12 months. That's the, that's the fastest the Fed right. funds rates has, has raised in a really, really long time. Very fast. Um, so I think we're going to see that coming down a little bit. That's awesome. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. So what if you do that? So if you go, if I, so we, we actually did this and I'm going to ask you this question because yeah. I think you can speak to this a little bit better. So we have a primary house. 
we have enough equity, we can get a fifty thousand dollar HELOC on it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm gonna rent. I'm going to plan to rent this out, yep. and then I'm gonna go use some of that HELOC as a down payment, yep. right, on my next primary house. Mm -hmm. What do you need to look at from the lender? What numbers need to work on your side? That's a great question. Um, for some people, maybe they can qualify for both mortgages without any additional. With just their income. With just their income. Yeah. You know, that's that's an option depending upon what they want to qualify for. But in many instances, mm -hmm. we uh, we are able to use a lease on the exit home. Gotcha. So basically, typically what you would do is just you need to have a, a security deposit and a lease signed by the time that you close on the purchase of your new property. And we're able to use 75% of that lease. Because once yep. you, obviously, as you know, with a rental, there That's are right. going to be expenses. So we can't use that full amount. Can't do 100%. Yeah, I can't do 100%. Right. But 75% yeah. up, to, up to what your mortgage payment is. Perfect. So we can go up to offsetting that mortgage. So now you're only qualifying for the new mortgage payment. Really powerful, right? It's huge, yeah. Like super, super powerful. I think what's powerful. really neat about that is, um, so what we, I'll just give you my own personal example. So we, we put, got the HELOC, right? Yeah. We took some of that as a down payment for our next house. Yeah. The rent that the tenants were paying, I used to pay down that HELOC first, right? So That's smart. So, really smart. Um, so I paid down the HELOC, and then uh, the rent that was coming in was now paying for our payment on our new house, too. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always work that way, right? No, but it definitely can. For but it sure. can. So it definitely can. What does it give you? Options, right? So, yep. so now you're gonna you're gonna pay that HELOC down, and then if you do, you know, if, if for some reason you get a five thousand dollar expense you weren't expecting, you don't have the cash, pull that right out of the HELOC again, mm -hmm. and then you can use that to then um, pay for that in your rental property or whatever, you know. Right. So, again, we just talk about options, and there's creative creative options with that, right? Right. Which I love that because. You know, but I think it's important to know it's a 10 year draw period. So you can't, you know, we, we have to keep that in mind. You don't want to run it all the way up and then go, oh, shoot, I don't know how I'm going to pay this off. Right. You have to have a plan for it. Right. right? Am I going to refinance? Am I going to get a new HELOC? Right. What am I going to do with it? You right. know, we don't know when you get closer. And I think that's what you're really good about, Ryan, yeah. is you're keeping an eye out for people saying, hey, you know, your rates are gone down. I think it might be a good time for you to, to refinance. This might make sense for you. Right. Yep. Or we get closer to our HELOC, you know, draw period where, you know, eight years into it, two years left, you would come to them and be like, hey, here's what I think we could do here. Right. A lot of a lot of managing the mortgage post closing. Is, yes. Is, is, uh, people don't realize that's what I do on a, on right. a pretty frequent basis is yeah. I, I stay in touch with clients. Right. We want to make sure 100%. we're doing best by you. Because things change with your family. Maybe you That's come right. into some money and you want to invest, or now is the time to consolidate your HELOC and your and your primary mortgage into one. They're right? all into one. Exactly. There's yeah. a lot that we do on the back end that absolutely uh, that is people kind of forget about. So, right. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah. Well, and you have you know if what that prevents right is I get to year nine and a half right, and then I'm panicking and going, Ryan, what do I do? You right. Know what I mean, I don't right. like, and then and then you're scrambling at that point, right? right. You're not the expert in this That's world. Right. I am. I'm here to help you with that. Exactly. Yeah. And so if you know you've got someone who's looking out for you and those things, um, and of course you want to pay attention to it yourself. It's still for your sure. own finances, right, right? Right. 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 Like you know, we can't rely on everyone else to do it for <laughs> us. But knowing you have somebody else in your corner that's going to be there. Looking out for you, you know, if, if if someone's got a loan with somebody else, you're not tracking that loan, right? Yeah. The loans that close with you, you're there monitoring, looking at market conditions. Once I've closed all my loans, I could care less about most market conditions, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm, it's done. It's over. Exactly. And if and if I know, you know, if you're gonna come to me and be like, hey, yo, <laughs> rates just went yeah. down two percent. This would be a good time for you to refinance. Here's what we can do for you. You know that that's a huge value add. That, Absolutely. You know um, you wouldn't get otherwise. Absolutely. So yeah. Um, well, I think that covers everything that you know we wanted to talk to you guys about today. Hopefully, you found all of this really really useful. Yeah. Um, what I'd like to say, I mean, thank you for coming. Thank you for joining. Thanks for having me. It was me, a pleasure man. having yeah. you here. This guy is the the true investor specialist um, in Colorado and many other places and many other I don't places. think we actually mentioned that so yeah. and my, so what are those places yeah. that you can help out clients with great question so yeah. our brokerage what we do is we have um, we look for good places to invest in properties yeah and so uh, and good markets to go into so our brokerage is actually licensed in seven states yeah I don't know if I'm gonna get this all right so we I know we are Utah Nevada um, Idaho Kansas Missouri Colorado, obviously, and then yep. just Texas, actually, this month. Yeah. And so, um, so, and we actually look in very specific states, or yeah. sorry, 
very specific cities yeah, within markets, that state. Right. Yeah. So for example, Kansas City, and yeah. that's why we're in Missouri and Kansas, yeah. um, is a really good place to buy investment properties right now. Yeah. Um, just real quick, because we've done the done the work and the analysis that yeah. values went up, not as right. much as Denver, and right. there's still a lot of potential for values to increase and rents to increase and over time. Those are the markets that you want to invest the in. The markets you want to be in. You don't really know what market you should be in until you know. That's right. You know, right? Yeah, like you, exactly. get, you get a little 100%. bit of sense of that. You want to be the first ones there. And you guys are amazing at finding yeah. those opportunities right. before the whole world jumps on it. Exactly. Like Colorado. Yep. So and we don't just guess. Yeah. We have a whole report exactly. that we'll do on it and exactly. make sure it's a good spot to go yeah. to. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Well reach out to Brian. If you have any investing questions, obviously I'm here to help too, but Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you guys soon. See ya. Cheers.